Few Americans alive today are unaware that our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated while in office. It has been a part of American history textbooks for generations, but unanswered questions and little-known facts about his final hours remain, which are both revealing and disturbing. And it has been contended by forensic anthropologists that the president was actually dying months before the fatal shot, which ended his life. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809, on a farm near Hodgenville, Kentucky, and later moved to the edge of the frontier of Indiana when he was seven. A voracious reader, he had little formal education, but devoured every book he could get his hands on. The family moved to Illinois in 1830, when Abe turned 21, and he struck out on his own. Becoming an entrepreneur, he co-owned a general store for several years, until selling his stake and enlisting in the militia as captain, Illinois was being threatened in the Black Hawk War of 1832. Black Hawk, a Sauk chief, believed he had been swindled by a land deal and sought to reclaim his old holdings. Lincoln did not see direct combat during the Black Hawk War, but the horrific sight of the corpse-strewn battlefields at Stillman's Run and Kellogg's Grove haunted him a sight that would become all too familiar when the Civil War broke out 29 years later. After a lengthy law career as a self-described prairie lawyer during the early 1850s and an earlier term in Congress from 1847 to 1849, he joined the new Republican Party. As a prominent party member, he had a series of heated debates in 1858 with Stephen A. Douglas over slavery and its place in the United States. These debates catapulted Lincoln into a prominent figure in national politics. His anti-slavery platform made him highly unpopular with Southerners, and his nomination for president in 1860 turned them against him. With whispers of Southern secession brewing, on November 6, 1860, Lincoln secured the election for president without the support of a single southern state. Four short months later, on March 4, 1861, in his presidential inaugural address, he appealed to the rebellious southern states, seven of which had already seceded, to rejoin the Union. Less than 40 days later, on April 12, 1861, the Civil War began with the Confederate bombardment of Fort Sumter, South Carolina, situated in Charleston Harbor. Over the next four bloody years, a national tragedy on a scale unimaginable to the American Founding Fathers unfolded across America's once bucolic landscape. The strain of trying to preserve a Union that wanted to tear itself apart took a heavy toll on the once youthful American president. It was a burden that sent him into a deep depression, an affliction he had battled since childhood. By early 1865, it was evident that the war had aged him decades beyond his 56 years. The difference is striking in comparing a photograph of the president taken in January 1864 to one from February 1865. Modern endocrinologists examining the later photos of Lincoln contend that he was suffering from a rare endocrine disorder called MEN2B, or Multiple Endocrine Neoplasia Type 2B, in which most patients will die of thyroid cancer if the thyroid is not removed. One characteristic of this syndrome is the presence of mucosal neuromas, little bumps on the lips, Close examination of photographs suggests that he did have these. Whether this disorder was present, we perhaps will never know for sure. What is clear is that the president's demise was looming, a certainty that even Lincoln himself, it is said, foresaw. Ten days before his fateful trip to see the comedy farce Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater on the evening of April 14, 1865, he is reported to have had a prophetic dream predicting his own death. According to his close friend and sometimes bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamont, who shared the story in the 1880s, 
Lincoln experienced a precognitive dream where a death-like stillness suddenly surrounded him. He started to hear subdued sobs within the White House and wandered the halls, invisible, ending up at the East Room, which the President entered. There, he saw a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments and noticed soldiers acting as guards. Whether the tale is true or not is unknown. On the morning of his assassination, members of Lincoln's cabinet recalled that the president told them he dreamed of sailing across an unknown body of water at great speed the night before. He also revealed that he'd had the same dream repeatedly on previous occasions before, quote, nearly every great and important event of the war, unquote. No other event in the history of the Civil War shook the nation to its foundation then the shot fired shortly after 10 p.m. from the Derringer pistol held by John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln battled for life from the moment he slumped forward with a bullet through the brain. The first doctor to attend Lincoln was a 23-year-old Army captain named Charles A. Leal. He received his medical degree six weeks earlier, on March 1, from the Bellevue Hospital Medical College in New York. In 2012, a remarkable discovery was made by a research assistant working on the Papers of Abraham Lincoln project. The researcher found Dr. Leal had written a 22-page, almost hour-by-hour -hour accounting of the president's demise that had sat in the archives unread for nearly 150 years. The report was written only hours after Lincoln's death. In the report, Dr. Leal reported that he had reached the president and he was in a state of general paralysis. His eyes were closed and he was in a, quote, profoundly comatose condition, unquote. Leal was joined in the theater box by two other doctors, Charles Taft and A.F.A. King, and the three decided to move the mortally wounded president to a home across the street. That home was the Peterson Boarding House, owned by William and Anna Peterson at 453 10th Street. The president was carried to a room upstairs in the house, rented by Union soldier William T. Clark. Lincoln was placed on the bed in a diagonal position due to his 6-foot, 4-inch frame. Several of President Lincoln's closest advisors hovered nearby. All kept vigil throughout the night, but it was all for naught. By daybreak at 6.40 a.m., Dr. Leal wrote, his pulse could not be counted, it being very intermittent, two or three pulsations being felt and followed by an intermission, when not the slightest movement of the artery could be felt. The inspirations now became very short, and the expirations very prolonged and labored, accompanied by a guttural sound. Ten minutes later, at 6.50, alarmed by Lincoln's respirations becoming shallow and intermittent, Dr. Leal recorded, The Surgeon General now held his finger to the cartoid artery. Colonel Charles Crane held his head. Dr. Robert Stone, who was sitting on the bed, held his left pulse, and his right pulse was held by myself. Thirty minutes later, the end came. As Dr. Leal recorded, at 7.20 a.m., he breathed his last, then paraphrased Ecclesiastes 12.7. The spirit fled to God, who gave it. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton famously declared, Now he belongs to the ages. Although some historians have insisted that Stanton said, Now he belongs to the angels. Stanton then closed by distilling Lincoln's legacy which many Americans would still agree with today. There lies the most perfect ruler of men the world has ever seen. <laughs>